All this is Dr. Mobin Sayyid from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So today, once again, we have a rock star that has been with us before. That is Dr. Antonatos. He has been practicing for COVID, I think, for months now and with a lot of success. He is the doctor when he came in last time, he was mentioning, which struck me at that time as well, was that he would go to Facebook groups. He would go and follow the other doctors who have been helping who have been researching and figure out who, how to manage COVID. So these are the kind of doctors that I think we need at this time. So Dr. Antonatos, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us once more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bovin. Um, I'm very uh, 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 pleased to be here. And this is a privilege to be here on your show tonight. And um, hello to all the cool beans as well. Uh, tune in uh, in the show. Um, just to introduce a little bit about myself, um, uh, uh, as Dr. Bean uh, already introduced me, uh, but uh, just to let you know a little bit about me, I'm uh, uh, Dr. Miguel Antonatos, I'm a board certified internal medicine physician. I'm the founder of the telemedicine company uh, Text2MD, uh, which uh, Dr. Bean is showing uh, my website at this moment. I have been uh, helping patients with, uh, um, uh, with um, medical health needs and mostly with uh, uh, during the pandemic, my uh, telemedicine company started. I have been helping mostly patients with a medication refill. Uh, since then, I've been following most of the research uh, from Dr. Merrick and the FLCCC. And uh, we have been implemented uh, uh, in our practice uh, the IMAS protocol that was uh, originally implemented back in December. Um, and we have been treating uh, many patients uh, with active COVID and actually helping patients also with a uh, a prophylaxis uh, or prevention uh, for COVID-19. So, uh, Dr. Antonatos, thank you very much for the introduction. Using this site, can you tell us how will somebody reach out to you? What is the process? Yeah, so uh, it's very simple. The, um, as this is a telemedicine company, I need uh, to have uh, an application, uh, mostly to communicate with patients. Um, I have a phone number where patients can uh, uh, contact us. Uh, there will be a directed to a call center when uh, uh, the person at the call center will uh, get all the patient information. Uh, mostly what we need is a phone number to reach you or a, an email address as we uh, mainly communicate through email. Uh, and then we explain how to uh, uh, get the application and then uh, to the download. And uh, we are able to uh, provide your service, uh, medical service, uh, uh, for any 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 kind of uh, medical service, I mean, actually, I uh, uh, post in my uh, website. I treat over 80 medical conditions. I'm an internist, so most of the conditions that internal medicine physician able to treat, uh, I'm able to treat through tele telemedicine. Some of those conditions may be limited due to a physical exam, as telemedicine is not for every single condition. But most of them, the 80 that I listed. Uh, in my websites are those conditions that are able to uh, provide service through telemedicine. So basically, a patient uh, can reach us a call or text, or they can click on that bottom where it says download the app. And uh, I use right now an application called Medici. Uh, this is a very simple uh, application for patients. They just need uh, to add their name, address, and date of birth. And they can uh, send me a text from there. Um, I don't charge for any question if you want to text me or uh, let me know what, what's going on or your symptoms or any simple questions, uh, you can reach me uh, there. And uh, uh, definitely, there is no charge for that. Um, this is only a charge for a consultation completed. And we uh, were able to uh, uh, provide your service and uh, 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 prescribe medication if needed. Uh, that's the only reason we charge. But uh, other than that, uh, yeah, you can always reach us for any questions. Got it. Thank you very much. And Cool Beans, uh, when we are doing this show and I am looking here, I'm not really looking away from Dr. Antonatos. I am looking at your comments over here. And if you have any questions that you want to ask, please make sure that there is some some sort of a flag in the comment, either write QQQ before the comment or a question mark, question mark, question mark, something that I can detect that this is a question and then use that to ask questions. The, the format of the program is that today I'm going to ask my questions first. I want to figure out how Dr. Antonatos is at this time uh, managing patients, acute COVID and long COVID and post uh, vaccine injuries. And after that, I would also want to add your questions too. 
So please hold on to your questions for now. And in another 10, 15 minutes, we'll start including your questions too. So with this, let's start. Uh, so Dr. Antonatos, tell me this. The, so you've been treating COVID for a long time now. Is there any symptom change that you see, number one? And number two, is there a cohort change? Do you see more youngsters now, more men now, more women now, more children? What is the, uh, what is the current practice like? Um, so certainly I seem, uh, I have observed uh, some changes um, on uh, uh, mostly the patient demographic and uh, the severity of their symptoms as well. And also symptoms, uh, specific symptoms as well have been uh, a, a little more different than uh, when we were uh, treating the original variant and all the, all the other uh, early variants, the alpha and beta. Um, so, uh, so definitely I've seen uh, a younger population um, uh, getting sicker uh, than way before. Uh, patient uh, usually come uh, with er early symptoms uh, in around uh, two days to three, three, three days. Uh, patient uh, start relating uh, severe symptoms of COVID-19. Most of those symptoms I've seen observing, um, uh, most, most of the time patient come with a, a sore throat. That's something that I did not see much uh, with other variants. Um, so whoever, uh, whenever a patient mentioned he have a sore throat or having severe symptoms, I start thinking right away he may have infected by a variant. And most of the time I've seen uh, the Delta variant based on research has been causing uh, this kind of uh, a kind of classic symptom, the, the sore throat. I still see anosmia, uh, loss of a sense of smell and taste. Um, uh, definitely the shortness of breath uh, is one of them. Um, and generalized mal malaise and fatigue is uh, patients uh, feel very, very debilitated, they are exhausted, um, they have very lack of energy. Uh, those are very uh, classic symptoms seen with uh, uh, this variant. And uh, Dr. Antonatos, are you seeing older population with more severe symptoms with the newer variants? Of course, we cannot tell who has what, what variant, but still imagine that nowadays we have new variants. Do you see the older population with more severe symptoms or less symptoms or similar? Is there, can we say that the variants are actually becoming a little less lethal or do you see similar intensity of the symptoms? Um, actually the variant I seen, uh, when I suspecting there is a variant, I suspect uh, the reason is uh, most of the time the patient uh, deteriorate quite, quite quickly, uh, rapidly, uh, even with a treatment, uh, even with starting treatment day one, uh, with a standard dose, dose of ivermectin, uh, way before I see those patients improving uh, dramatically after one or two doses of ivermectin. Uh, this time, I don't, I, I don't see that happening uh, that often. Uh, patients uh, do not improve in one or two days with a standard dose of ivermectin. Um, then in 48 hours, if patients are not improving, I decide to increase their uh, ivermectin dosage to the 0.4 milligram kg and adding the fluvoxamine. Um, most of the time, this is a uh, uh, based to the variant, as it's very aggressive and uh, it replicates pretty fast, uh, faster uh, than the other uh, uh, variants that we've seen before. Got it. Thank you very much. Now, on the on this, uh, the patients who are arriving, the youngsters that are arriving, um, are they getting to hospitals? Are your patients nowadays? Compared to patients before, are your patients going to hospital? I don't know if your patients went to hospital before or not or needed oxygen or not. What is the overall intensity? Yeah, most of the time um, when patients uh, require hospitalization is uh, when they come in a, a very late stage. Um, most of the time patients come with a day uh, five or above uh, with symptoms. Uh, most of the time when patients deteriorate and uh, require hospitalization, they come reach me after 10 days of, of, of having symptoms. They time their oxygen is very critical uh, and to the point that patient uh, most likely will require a supplemental oxygen soon. Uh, those patients, um, definitely I, I recommend to monitor their oxygenation very closely and any sudden drop uh, to be evaluated in person. However, uh, um, most of the patients, uh, uh, as soon as they start uh, the ivermectin, uh, they start, uh, if they don't improve in two days, I increase the dosage, but uh, if they improve, uh, the, you will see the oxygenation as well improving and uh, able to avoid any uh, ER uh, visit. Um, however, um, definitely I have 
patients are hospitalized with COVID-19, even despite the treatment. Um, those patients, uh, when they're in the hospital, they, uh, they don't have a long stay in the hospital. Most of the time they, they stay in the hospital three or four days max, and they go back home. I feel this is a, a could be related to the ivermectin uh, that they took prior to going to the hospital. Um, um, but definitely the rate, the rate of hospitalization I'm observing uh, uh, at this time, uh, I've seen more uh, younger uh, patient population uh, having to uh, require uh, at least an ER visit or very few have uh, required hospitalization, but definitely I've seen this change uh, with the uh, old variants and uh, uh, with this uh, new variant going on. Got it. Thank you very much. So I have a, these are two questions. I'm going to roll them into one. Nick is asking a similar question here. The question is, are you seeing your patients who had COVID before, are they coming back to you with COVID once more? And similarly, similar question, are you seeing vaccinated individuals coming back to you with COVID as well? Um, so definitely I've seen patients with COVID, um, uh, before uh, having infection, however, those patients have been uh, uh, when they have the uh, initial COVID infection was uh, uh, most of them have the COVID infection last year, uh, so it's having um, pretty much like a six months uh, uh, time lapse or more uh, since they have the first original infection and then uh, they get reinfected again. Those patients, uh, they uh, definitely they have a. Uh, um, uh, there is a variation of uh, uh, severity of those patients. Some of those patients come a little more severe. Uh, some of those patients relate that their infection is uh, uh, milder than the original uh, infection. Um, but definitely I've seen patients reinfected uh, uh, from before. As well, uh, when I'm working in the hospital, I uh, see patients uh, uh, hospitalized um, after uh, uh, with the vaccination, status post vaccination for uh, a few weeks. Uh, and after the second shot, actually, I'm seeing patients in the hospital with severe COVID or requiring hospitalization. Some of them actually require ICU care. Um, so definitely, uh, this is something that I've seen in the hospital, and uh, I've seen patients uh, uh, even with the vaccine. Actually, I have uh, uh, some anecdotes of when I was working in the hospital a few months ago. Uh, one of the physicians uh, uh, that worked along with me uh, mentioned that uh, one of his friends um was a physician from india uh, was fully vaccinated back in december uh when they were vaccinating health workers and uh, uh the physician decided to go to india visit family after uh, being full vaccinated and uh, unfortunately the physician uh, uh he developed covid 19 in india and uh, he passed away uh, so this is something very shocking for me after i hear that uh based on the data from the manufacturer from the vaccine uh, that was very unlikely to happen then I start uh, looking at a uh, real world data is uh, very different than what uh, manufacturers were uh, relating to us and uh, the FDA. Um, so definitely I've seen a uh, patient uh, being fully vaccinated and uh, still developing uh, a severe COVID-19. Um, so the, the vaccine yeah, definitely uh, um, is not 100%. And uh, uh, with more incoming variants, uh, I've seen reports that uh, variants are happening uh, every two weeks. Uh, variants are of concerns, not that often, uh, locally. Um, but this Delta variant is uh, yeah, definitely very aggressive. And uh, I've seen a lack of effectiveness in the vaccine over a period of time. Got it. Got it. Thank you very much. So uh, for the rest of the program, I'm going to do this. That First, I want to ask you about the prophylaxis. Then we'll talk about acute COVID management you're doing. Then we'll talk about uh, long COVID management. And then we'll talk about the post-vaccine uh, symptoms or injury management. So these are the four topics I want to go over. So let's start with the first one. How are you prophylaxing or are you prophylaxing your patients? Yeah, absolutely. I uh, recommend prophylaxis for uh, post-exposure, um, virtually for uh, all patients. Uh, for post-exposure prophylaxis, if they feel they, they got exposed uh, for a prolonged period of time with a, a suspected uh, COVID patient or confirmed COVID patient, I definitely uh, recommend um, a ivermectin uh, as a prophylaxis step. And uh, a patient with a high risk, uh, I would recommend a, a long-term uh, prophylaxis with ivermectin. 
I as well um, uh, recommend for uh, uh, children uh, uh, that are um, having uh, uh, severe symptoms, I recommend uh, patients uh, as well to take uh, Avermectin as a treatment. For prophylaxis for children, I recommend mostly for post-exposure, as I mentioned earlier, for all patients. But for long-term, uh, not really recommended at this point uh, a long-term prophylaxis for children, mostly for adults. Got it. And uh, moving to the, uh, I'm just going to look at some of the comments here to see if anything related to prophylaxis. So again, uh, audience, Cool Beans here, please see that we cannot offer an advice to a specific person. However, we can talk about in uh, theory or in uh, hypothesis what may be educational for physicians to treat a specific case. So for example, here, seven-year-old type 1 diabetic, susceptible of catching infection, should they be put on prophylaxis, for example, like ivermectin? Um, so based on some data have been uh, uh, coming off from uh, mostly from the UK, uh, the pediatric population is uh, a very low risk uh, to develop a, a severe uh, COVID-19. Um, uh, I've seen a report that uh, actually is, is uh, a 99.9 of uh, pediatric patients, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, they don't develop this severe COVID uh, uh, infection that requires hospitalization. And even with uh, uh, risk factors like diabetes, uh, and asthma, uh, they don't require uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, care in the hospital. Uh, therefore, I, I won't recommend a long term of prophylaxis. However, we we'll recommend treatment and we we'll recommend a post for post exposure uh, prophylaxis. Got it. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, Samina is asking Do you have any experience with the pregnancy, with pregnancy and ivermectin? So we know that um, it is contraindicated, but do you use it or do you not use it? Yeah, at this, at this time, I'm not using uh, ivermectin in, uh, in pregnant patients. I have been using it uh, for uh, patients that are breastfeeding, but uh, in pregnancy, I have been uh, holding uh, using ivermectin for uh, post exposure or, uh, for, or for treatment as well. So, just to be clear, you are not administering ivermectin to pregnant or breastfeeding women? Yeah, for, for breastfeeding, I, I do ivermectin. For pregnant, I, I do not do ivermectin. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so, Samina, I hope that is clear. Uh, Roman says prophylaxis, how often and what dosage with these variants? So, uh, the same, um, I'm using the same dosage uh, per the FLCCC. Uh, they haven't changed the uh, uh, recommendation. Um, uh, I've, uh, I use the 0 0.2 milligram per kg. That's the same dosage that they have been recommending. And uh, I do uh, the uh, prophylaxis in uh, loading dose on day one, then repeat in 48 hours. And this will be for a post-exposure prophylaxis uh, for a longer term. Uh, will be similar. Uh, and the, uh, the change will be uh, uh, you will take weekly dose instead of uh, uh, just in one day and then 48 hours. But you will continue a weekly dose of uh, avermectin uh, to continue the maintenance prophylaxis. Got it. Thank you. Uh Irma says, how long can adults take avamectin as prophylaxis? Months? So right now, uh, that's very unclear. I've seen research, um, some studies showing uh, a patient population have been uh, adult, mostly uh, patient population from studies from South America, have been taking the avermectin uh, for uh, years, but mostly for parasite-related uh, conditions. And uh, this is not uh, being studied as a, a weekly dosage. Uh, mostly with parasite prophylaxis, uh, for parasite prophylaxis, I've been taking uh, one dose uh, a month. And uh, I've seen studies just showing a uh, patient I've been taking it this for years. Uh, I've seen actually one study showing a uh, patient I've been taking it for up to 16 years and no health related uh, uh, deterioration or any condition happen after uh, taking uh, for that uh, prolonged period of time. However, uh, there is no clear now um, with the weekly dosage. There is no many. There is no much data or uh, studies uh, uh, done um, uh, with this weekly dosage. Uh, at this uh, right now, what I'm recommending patient is to. Uh, it's not absolutely uh, necessary, but it's a recommendation I have. Uh, at least to check uh, some uh, uh, basic metabolic panel and, uh, and uh, a hepatic uh, uh, liver function test. 
as well, uh, just to ensure uh, everything uh, is, is um, not having any side effects or any uh, uh, organ uh, injury from uh, uh, taking this medication. However, um, the safety uh, in, in has been so in our medicine uh, has been a uh, uh, this has been many research uh, uh, so in the safety of ivermectin and uh, it does not cause any uh, liver impairment, no, no, do not cause any damage. Most of these uh, studies causing some uh, uh, liver impairment has been done uh, with patients uh, uh, taking ivermectin and with concomitant infection with oncocerciasis. Um, so it's not clear if uh, uh, this association uh, uh, could be uh, related, but uh, there have been studies with patient, healthy patients with no uh, other infection taking ivermectin and no, no complication with a liver test or any other complications. Actually, uh, my patients have, have been uh, following their blood work and uh, their uh, liver function test actually looks uh, completely normal after taking the ivermectin for a prolonged period of time and patients have been tolerating pretty well uh, the dosage. I mean, I have patients taking the ivermectin. Uh, the longest I have is a uh, patient have been taking ivermectin for up to a year and uh, uh, no health conditions are reported, no side effects. And uh, upon investigating uh, uh, blood work, uh, everything is uh, within normal limits. That's very good to know. So longest is one year and no issues with the liver. Thank you. Uh, Colin Hamill says, is it possible that these new variants are influenza A or B? If we would, if so, would people end up getting treated for the wrong thing? So are these new variants actually influenza variants or viruses instead of uh, Delta, instead of Corona? Um, no, definitely this is, uh, seems to be uh, a COVID uh, uh, just evolving into variants. Uh, I do not believe uh, this is influenza. Uh, the COVID test pretty much uh, show uh, detecting the PCR on patient uh, uh, having infection. This is very uh, rare when a patient mentioned they have the Delta variant. I have been probably, I uh, have seen a couple of patients mentioning, uh, come to me and, and getting tested and uh, mentioning that got tested and uh, the variant was the Delta. I'm not sure where, which kind of test, but uh, I have just a couple of patients reporting that. Uh, but yeah, I do not believe this is an influenza issue. I think this is definitely COVID. I believe that as well. I don't think it is influenza issue. So having said that, let's switch from prophylaxis to, uh, or before we switch, do you test for the, the patient's vitamin D as well in general? Um, I, in one of the, my uh, questionnaires, I don't test a patient uh, for uh, vitamin D uh, levels per se uh, initially. However, I have in my questionnaire, uh, when I ask questions to the patient, I have a clinical questionnaire um, for uh, new patients um, asking for prophylaxis or treatment. And one of the questions I ask if they have uh, any diagnosis of vitamin D deficiency. Um, yeah. So definitely those patients with vitamin D deficiency, the deficiency uh, they will fall into the high risk category. Uh, up to develop a severe COVID. Got it. So um, Zan Solo says, and I want to switch now to the acute disease as well. So what COVID patients at stage three and four benefit from ivermectin? So why not we roll the with the other question with this as well? So acute patients. So somebody who comes to you, you suspect they have COVID. How do you manage them? So um, right now, as we live in a pandemic, um, I, uh, I, patients don't, don't need to show me a COVID test to be treated. As long as this uh, patient having symptoms uh, compatible with COVID-19, uh, those patients have been treated immediately. I recommend early treatment as, uh, a, as I always uh, learn that uh, treating a disease or a illness, the earliest you treat it, the best the outcome. Um, right now in this uh, pandemic, uh, we don't know if this is uh, related to just a cold or, the, or this is uh, just the starting of a COVID. So uh, definitely I, 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 I treat those patients uh, with ivermectin. Uh, if they come and they test negative and they improve uh, and there's mild symptoms, I definitely I, 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 I give the option to continue ivermectin to five, five more days or they can discontinue ivermectin if they're feeling much better. Um, but definitely, I think at this point uh, in the pandemic and with these variants that are very aggressive, I mean, uh, with the Delta variant, I've seen patients deteriorating in a couple of days. Uh, I, I don't hesitate to, to treat them. I definitely treat them. They don't need to show me a positive test. Got it. And um, at what stage do you add or do you add steroids and fluvoxamine like things at all in acute, acute 
COVID or just the ivermectin? I um well, uh, most of the patients definitely ivermectin uh, unless there is a, a contraindication, which uh, there is a, a virtually there is no much contraindication to take ivermectin. There is some uh, a, cautious uh, need to be cautious with some medications uh, with ivermectin, like the warfarin. Uh, may interact uh, with ivermectin. However, in my uh, in my practice, I've been uh, having patients taking the warfarin, and I have been using ivermectin. I actually have been using a higher doses, of 0 0.4 milligrams. I ask patients to follow the INR almost daily, and uh, I don't see much variation on their INR. However, there is uh, something to just to be cautious and just to monitor INR. Um, so definitely, all patients uh, can take ivermectin. I start everybody with ivermectin. And then uh, if patient um, eh, not improving in a couple of days, uh, I start patient on fluvoxamine. Some patients already come with symptoms uh, lasting three, four days. Those patients I, I started uh, right away uh, with uh, both uh, uh, drugs. I start with ivermectin and fluvoxamine at the same time. And then I, I uh, monitor patient symptoms. I follow with them, um, uh, see how, how they're doing after the, the initial treatment. If patient uh, report improvement symptoms, we continue. Uh, if patient uh, report no, no improvement, then uh, the patient I, I start on ivermectin and they say there is no improvement, then I start on fluvoxamine. The patient that I start on fluvoxamine and ivermectin together, they mention no improvement, then I increase the ivermectin dosage to 0 0.4 milligrams uh, kg. Got it. Thank you very much. Jim has a question. Do you believe this treatment will work equally well for the flu? So fluvoxamine, ivermectin, can this work for other antivirals, especially for other viral situations, especially flu? Um, it could be. I mean, theoretically, I mean, uh, ivermectin, I mean, having research, uh, it has been, uh, it have an antiviral property for other viruses. Um, so. It could be possible uh, that it could be uh, a, an alternative uh, option. Uh, however, uh, it is uh, most stu studied with other viruses like dengue virus, uh, Zika virus, uh, with the influenza. I, I do not uh, think that it, it will be highly effective against influenza. However, with the other viruses, uh, definitely have uh, a more activity and uh, a, yeah, definitely with COVID-19 as well. Got it. Thank you. Sumit so says, do you add favipiravir, budesonide, inhaler? Do you prefer aspirin of NAOC like rivaroxaban and so on? Sumit is a doctor as well. Yeah, so um, um, right now I'm uh, following the FLCCC protocol. Uh, I have been uh, definitely having uh, prescribed budesonide. Uh, so some, some patients are requesting it. However, uh, uh, most of the patients uh, improve uh, without adding the budesonide. I, I don't do the, any uh, other antiviral uh, except of the ivermectin, which uh, definitely is uh, antiviral properties. Um, anticoagulant, I uh, have been using anticoagulant mostly in the hospital uh, for outpatient setting. I, I prefer to use the high dose aspirin. I have not used uh, uh, anticoagulant for patients uh, uh, in the patient setting. However, uh, when patients start dropping oxygenation, there is something to consider. Uh, um, it start uh, either anticoagulation dose or start on ciprolactadine and, and dexamethasone uh, to improve the inflammation. Most of the time, I, I notice uh, when patients are in the inflammatory phase, the oxygen start dropping, and, and this is the time to start uh, a, a steroids and uh, consider that ciprolactadine steroids is, is are not working uh, properly or, or oxygenation don't improve uh, in a, a timely manner. Uh, so, but uh, anticoagulant per se, I have not used uh, in outpatient, but uh, hospital setting only. Got it. Thank you. So a miscellaneous question, uh, not related to the acute uh, treatment, but important question from Dr. Nick. What percentage of sy symptomatic patients you see are fully vaccinated? Um, so I start um, uh, gathering some data about patients uh, with vaccination. Uh, it's still too early to say um, the data that I have uh, uh, has been gathered for a month. Uh, however, uh, it's, 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 um, uh, some patients, um, uh, they don't uh, report. Um, uh, some patients, I, I, 
I decide to do a questionnaire for the vaccination if uh, they have been taking the vaccine or if they don't want to report the vaccination status, that's okay with them. But uh, the data that I have is very fresh, uh, uh, but uh, percentage wise, I would say it's very low still. It's very low, but the data is very fresh. Got it. JM says, and by the way, I think your mic still has, when you start speaking, there's a little crackle. Maybe moving the mic a little farther might help. I do not know exactly how it would, but if, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, and thank you, my apologies for this. JM says, do you prescribe hydroxychloroquine? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, hydroxychloroquine, mostly for, uh, um, I used to do the uh, hydroxychloroquine um, prior uh, to um, sticking to the FLCCC protocol, the eye mask. Um, however, I especially request uh, uh, hydroxy uh, hydroxychloroquine. I don't, I don't see any objection. However, I don't see uh, this to be an effective treatment as uh, ivermectin is. I uh, recommend mostly for patients, uh, mostly for prevention. Uh, taking the hydroxychloroquine uh, early uh, uh, will be helpful for prevention. Some patients decide to take uh, both drugs together. I will make a hydroxychloroquine to, uh, I think if, uh, they want to uh, have uh, extra protection, which is uh, fair. Um, however, I, I let them know I've been making, uh, per se, uh, it's, it's very effective for prevention. In the uh, last uh, meta-analysis, um, I, I see uh, it was effective on uh, 86% uh, of, uh, of patients. So is this a very, uh, way very effect effective uh, uh, prophylactic or prevention? Um, the hydroxychloroquine studies, uh, I, I have not followed much of the hydroxychloroquine studies recently. Uh, that was only last year, um, but whoever is sticking up to the FLCC protocol, uh, but if patients have a certain preference, I don't see any problem and I can prescribe the hydroxychloroquine. Got it, thank you. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm gonna take the next question. I just I don't wanna put you on the spot here. D Daniel Thompson says, is ivermectin more effective than dexamethasone for treating COVID? Uh, they are both for different uh, phases. One is for the viral phase and one is for the inflammatory. So that comparison to each other is probably not fair. Uh, what do you think, uh, Dr. Uh, Antonatos? Yeah, definitely. I agree. I um, uh, my, my treatment approach is to, uh, when you have a uh, viral infection, uh, the first thing you want to do, you want to get rid of the virus. Um, so the ivermectin will be uh, uh, the medication uh, uh, that will do the job. Uh, it will get rid of the virus. Uh, I have uh, different pathways uh, to treat the virus. And uh, in, in the early stage, definitely, this is the way to go. Uh, the, the steroids, I, I do not um, do a steroid early stage. Um, based on some studies showing uh, it could potentially uh, could, uh, it cause some viral replication and hasten. Uh, so most of the time I use the uh, uh, steroid for the late stages uh, of COVID uh, when the patient is in an inflammatory phase. Uh, those are very effective uh, medications to use, but uh, I, I do not use uh, for early uh, presentation. Got it. Paulette Rose says, is ivermectin safe for a patient with declining kidney function, stage 3A? Oh yeah, certainly. Um, ivermectin uh, is uh, a highly metabolizing liver. You have uh, a very uh, little clearance in the kidney, and the manufacturer and uh, uh, does not have any dose adjustment for patients with chronic kidney disease or even with a hemodialysis. So a patient can take the the same dosage uh, if they have a chronic kidney disease or or patient dialysis. Got it. Uh, so I'm gonna move from acute patient care to long hauler and two types of long haulers. One is the post COVID long hauler. And the second one is vaccine, post vaccine symptoms that are persisting. So let's start with the post COVID long hauler. One curiosity that I have, number one, out of the patients who start with you early, how many of them become long hauler? And the reason for this question is that do you feel that if we treat someone early, they don't become long hauler? And the second part of the question is, do you see people who become long haulers and had asymptomatic COVID, meaning they didn't even know that they had COVID at some point, but they are presenting with long haul symptoms? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, uh, patients, uh, when I treat patients uh, uh, with early presentation, they have definitely better outcome uh, with than patients uh, uh, come with a la later stages of uh, infection. Uh, as all illnesses and diseases that you treat earlier, uh, the best the outcome. So most of those patients, they don't they don't come back uh, reporting uh, uh, symptoms uh, of uh, long long COVID or long haul. Uh, patient that treat uh, immediately, a uh, patient that get uh, having the symptoms, they get tested and they test positive. Those patients I treat immediately with ivermectin, they get better uh, uh, very soon. And they don't develop. I, I haven't seen any of them uh, developing long haul symptoms. Most of those patients develop their long haul symptoms mostly when uh, they come with a definitely a later presentation of the disease. They let the, the virus do all the damage uh, the virus have been done and uh, potentially uh, will cause uh, uh, the inflammatory phase, uh, the macrophage uh, uh, depolarization and uh, uh, muscle cell activation. So those patients are uh, definitely uh, uh, the longer uh, waiting to be treated. I mean, uh, they, there is a high risk of uh, developing the long haul symptoms. As well, I've seen uh, patients uh, um, uh, from last year, uh, patients, uh, there were not if they uh, uh, having the COVID infection or not. So those patients have very mild symptoms. They believe it was a, a cold. They did not go tested. Uh, and they come back uh, uh, to me, uh, relating me, they have, uh, after having these cold symptoms, they having this uh, joint pain. They, they feel exhausted. Um, they, they have forgetfulness, brain fog. Uh, at that time, I suspect uh, this patient most likely had a COVID infection. Most, most likely, was those they call uh, either asymptomatic or very mild disease. Uh, they did, did not get tested and uh, developed the long haul symptoms. Uh, so every patient I, I, I let know that uh, it's better to actually uh, to prevent uh, uh, the infection per se because uh, we don't want want to take that risk of uh, 10 or 30 percent uh, risk of developing uh, long haul symptoms. Got it. So this is, I think, a very important point. And that is that it is actually possible for someone to develop asymptomatic infection and still become long hauler. This actually also underscores the importance for continuous vitamin D levels correction and possibly prophylaxis as well. So uh, uh, Dr. Antonatos, how do you manage a long haul? So imagine if I come to you and I say I have brain fog, I have difficulty in concentration. Uh, what do you? How do you start managing me? So um, um, at the beginning of the uh, when I started uh, uh, rendering services for uh, COVID patients, I was uh, mostly uh, a, a seen patient with acute COVID, and patient uh, also came asking me for a, a preventive uh, a ivermectin for COVID. Uh, I did not see uh, um, or at the beginning many long haul patients. However, uh, around February uh, this year, I started seeing a uh, patient with long uh, long haul symptoms. I started uh, uh, researching around uh, see wh what would be a good uh, effective treatment for uh, uh, long long hauls. And um, one of the research I looked uh, was uh, a research back in July 2020 from uh, a Peruvian doctor, uh, Dr. Gustavo Aguirre Chan. Um, he have a recent study uh, using ivermectin, the 0.4 milligram dose, and alternating with a 0.2 milligram dose. Uh, he reported uh, a 95, uh, around 95 percent, or a little higher improvement from uh, a patient with a, a moderate uh, to mild symptoms. Uh, in that study, those patients uh, have uh, a, a long haul symptoms. Uh, I believe was 12 weeks. Uh, patient with long haul symptoms and they improve uh, with ivermectin alternate dose. Uh, so that was my first approach uh, with long haul symptoms. I started using uh, what uh, a research uh, of Dr. Aguirre uh, showing. I uh, start uh, using a patient with a mild symptoms, the 0.2 milligram dose for four days. Uh, patient with moderate symptoms, I do the 0.4 milligrams uh, daily for four days. If patient continue with symptoms, I extend uh, uh, the treatment. And um, most of the time, patient don't, do not get better in the first uh, round. So uh, I used to uh, have to treat those patients uh, actually for two or three weeks uh, with ivermectin. And they, they, when they start uh, uh, have reporting much improvement of symptoms or a resolution of symptoms, then I stop the protocol. 
uh, with ivermectin, but that was uh, my, my original approach uh, when treating uh, long-haul patients. Um, as, uh, as well, the, uh, Dr. Aguirre has been uh, having uh, 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 some dietary recommendations that are very important. I uh, definitely let know the patient that dietary, the dietary modifications are important. Uh, uh, Anti-inflammatory diet is very important. And uh, uh, some, measure, uh, some supplements as well uh, in order to modulate the immune system uh, uh, and uh, this, um, the mast cell activation as well. Uh, so there is a, a other uh, over-the-counter medication and supplement uh, uh, I start using uh, based on uh, uh, this research I was looking around. Um, also, I have been joining uh, uh, some social media, mostly in Facebook. There is a long haul uh, group. Um, originally, when I joined them, uh, they were around 12,000 patients, so they were all mostly relating anecdotes. Or, uh, I'm trying to investigate uh, which medicine worked for them and what, what working for them. So it was very um, helpful uh, to uh, uh, read all the anecdotes of patients and interact a little bit with them. Um, that's what I learned that most of these patients uh, improve with antihistamines. Um, uh, so I started implementing antihistamines for, for, for my patient, the uh, H1 and H2, and I started using uh, uh, supplements as well, the vitamin D, vitamin C. Um, uh, I'm using uh, luteolin as well, um, uh, as this is uh, uh, a flavonoid that has uh, potent anti-inflammatory properties and uh, uh, help for uh, uh, mast cell uh, deregulation. Um, so those are kind of uh, uh, how I started uh, 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 looking around how to treat patients with a long haul, and most of those patients are improving uh, with ivermectin and, and the dietary modification and the supplements. Thereafter, uh, uh, I um, uh, was reached by Steve Kirsch. Uh, he has been uh, uh, founding a research with uh, fluvoxamine, and uh, he uh, reached me. Uh, 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 mostly uh, along with uh, uh, Dr. Sayed Hader. Um, we discussed the, uh, the fluvoxamine and, uh, uh, for treatment with COVID-19 uh, for acute treatment. He's uh, the founder of the early uh, treatment campaign. So, def uh, so I started um, uh, along with Dr. Hader, uh, I started using the ivermectin and the fluvoxamine with a patient with acute COVID and definitely see much uh, improvement uh, the, than the monotherapy only with ivermectin. Uh, then upon discussion, we have some uh, discussion uh, uh, in emails um, and relating some anecdotes and uh, kind of discussing what, what has been working for us and uh, why it's not working. Um, some, uh, so some patients actually uh, uh, reported using the fluvoxamine uh, for long haul symptoms. And that's when uh, uh, we started uh, looking around uh, the possibility of using adding the fluvoxamine for mostly patients with a uh, 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 mostly with a uh, uh, brain symptoms, neurologic symptoms like brain fog. Um, so I started using the, the fluvoxamine, and uh, uh, it has been very effective uh, to treat these uh, uh, long haul symptoms as well. Um, so I started using both medicines, uh, ivermectin and fluvoxamine, along with the supplements and uh, the dietary modifications and uh, patients have definitely have been improving uh, greatly with uh, uh, these, two, these two medications. However, they have been a uh, uh, percentage of patients they don't improve uh, as, as uh, I would like it to improve. Uh, those patients, uh, yeah, definitely we need to work a little bit longer uh, with them uh, with longer ivermectin dosages um, as well as uh, trying to look for uh, steroids as well if ivermectin did not work. I uh, usually um, start using a, a, a short course steroid. It's a very uh, a, a beneficial uh, drug for inflammation. And uh, so I've been using the steroid after using the course of ivermectin for three weeks and using fluvoxamine for 14 days. If patients still uh, having lingering symptoms, I use the uh, 15 days uh, prednisone uh, dosage per the I recover protocol. Um, there is other, many other drugs that I use as well. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, antihistamines and um, uh, have been implemented as well as torbastatin for the eye recovery protocol, uh, which uh, will help as well with inflammation and the uh, uh, macrophage depolarization. Got it. So thank you very much. The, the patients of tinnitus or tinnitus and the patients with the visual disturbances, do you do anything special separately or they still get ivermectin, fluvoxamine, steroid combinations? 
for patient, yeah, for patient with a tinnitus, um, definitely I use the the same protocol, the same uh, I recover protocol. I start every patient. I start with a flu. Uh, sorry, I start every patient with a vermectin um, for uh, um, initially. Then, uh, depending of patient have a, a neurological symptoms or not, I add the flu box. I mean, however, I, I start using uh, both medicine uh, because most of patients uh, uh, they, they they have most most of the time they have uh, both symptoms, so I have been using both medication uh, with improvement as uh, uh, most of these uh, 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 cranial nerve uh, symptoms like tinnitus or uh, vision impairment. They uh, uh, it seems to be a uh, um, uh, improving uh, when I add in the flu box, I mean, mostly. Got it. So thank you very much for this one. Um, I'm just looking here to see if there are any um, more questions that are related to this phase, uh, this phase of the discussion. There was a question about which states do you practice in? Would you like to tell us how many states do you practice in? Yeah, so um, currently I'm um, uh, in 33 states. Um, I have a new state that is uh, New York State. Uh, recently got the license a couple of weeks ago after um, uh, four months of uh, uh, trying to get the license. But uh, finally I'm there uh, in New York uh, rendering services. I'm also in all the states that still have of the uh, COVID uh, emergency. I'm uh, rendering service in all those states. Um, but in total, um, it's uh, 33 states that we are uh, serving, um, working still in Texas, um, working in California, but we will be there um, very soon, I think. And I uh, definitely will be working on that. Welcome, welcome. So 32 states. Prince says, any suggestion for a nosmia, a gozia, tinnitus, 12 plus months long haul? Yes or no? So, um, um, so most of the time, those patients are uh, with these uh, uh, symptoms. I uh, start uh, very similar ivermectin uh, and fluvoxamine, and uh, if they don't improve with that uh, combination, then uh, there is a research study I, I read about uh, adding do doxycycline and uh, adding uh, uh, flonase and uh, methylprednisolone uh, for f uh, five days. And um, uh, there is a research uh, showing that uh, it was uh, uh, around uh, 54 patients. Uh, they, they did a regimen, and uh, around 90% uh, of those patients had recovered function of anosmia. Uh, however, uh, most of the time, I don't need to record to the doxycycline. Uh, most of the time, the ivermectin uh, and the fluvoxamine helps uh, greatly. Uh, with those patients that they don't improve the anosmia or the tinnitus, yeah, I use the, the doxycycline uh, dosage along with uh, methylprednisolone and the flonase. Got it. One quick question. Do you practice in New Hampshire as well? Yes, absolutely. I'm in New, York, New Hampshire. Excellent. So now I'm going to move to the last part of our discussion, and that is the post-vaccine injury or side effects or long haul. Are you seeing patients who have received vaccination, then they developed symptoms, and now they are suffering? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, there is, there is uh, yeah, different uh, uh, categories. I uh, differentiate categories uh, mostly with uh, uh, post-vaccine symptoms. Uh, most of the time, uh, uh, the vaccine will, will cause uh, side effects uh, based on the cytokine, uh, increase of cytokine. So those patients will have some fever. They may have soreness in the uh, arms that they uh, got vaccinated. So th most of the time, those patients, uh, they, uh, I just let them know uh, that those symptoms should get better on its own a uh, couple of days. Uh, but I see patients also coming after a week or two weeks, uh, still with symptoms. Those patients definitely, I suspect, they have an uh, injury uh, related to the vaccine. Uh, those patients come with uh, their symptoms are very similar uh, to long haul. Uh, they come, uh, uh, most of the time, they come with uh, a pain, uh, like joint, uh, joint pain, uh, muscle ache. Uh, they come with, with a very severe fatigue. Uh, some of them as well, they develop tinnitus, uh, some uh, vision uh, abnormalities. Uh, some patients as well uh, develop a, a variety of symptoms, but the most classic symptoms I've seen, uh, yeah, the malaise, fatigue, um, joint pain, uh, muscle aches. Um, those are the symptoms I've seen mostly, and they have been lingering symptoms. So the patient uh, uh, report having for weeks, 
at that time I don't, I don't, and definitely this is not a side effect from the vaccine. This is uh, has to be related to some sort of injury. So, um, how do you manage them? Those patients are being managed with uh, uh, ivermectin as well. Um, based on the theory, uh, there is a the, not not really a theory. It's a, actually a research already done. Uh, it's spike protein is a, a cytotoxic. Um, based on uh, uh, Dr. Malona uh, uh, mentioned, uh, a spike protein definitely is uh, it can be a uh, uh, cytotoxic. And uh, even though the manufacturer uh, uh, state that uh, they have uh, when when patient get the vaccine the spike protein stay in the muscle cell and should not be traveling around the uh, uh, bloodstream or, or your system however uh, they have been a story showing uh, uh, that they have been a uh, patient uh, having a uh, uh, blood draw and uh, showing spike protein after vaccination that patient may have having symptoms from the, the spike protein. At that point, uh, I start put those patients in ivermectin as ivermectin uh, dug into the spike protein, and uh, those patients uh, improve uh, uh, these symptoms. Uh, so most of those patients, I usually I do only ivermectin. I don't do the patient with post uh, uh, vaccine uh, injury. I only use the ivermectin. I, I do not use the fluvoxamine. Uh, as much uh, as as on the other side with a long haul patient, definitely they. I see most benefit with afloxamine and ivermectin together. Got it. Just a quick question. Rima, Rima is a healthcare professional as well. How many post-vaccine long haulers are you seeing? Is there a great number? Some people, how do you see that within your own practice? Um, so patient with a long haul. Um, so, um, so definitely, there is a research uh, showing uh, a patient after vaccination they can uh, get improvement from the long haul symptom. I believe it's around uh, 30 percent. Um, patient actually, and there is a, a, also a percentage of patients that get worse. Uh, I think it's around uh, 13, 14 percent of patients uh, after the vaccine they get worse symptoms. Um, in my practice, I've seen, yeah, I've seen patients uh, uh, getting vaccine and developing symptoms. Um, developing long haul symptoms per se um, is uh, difficult to tell as a long haul. Uh, uh, when I treat patients with long haul, I, uh, I, I <clears throat> categorize those patients having a symptom of, uh, uh, beyond 30 days. Most of the patients come with a vaccine after a few weeks. Uh, I haven't seen patients coming beyond 30 days with symptoms, but uh, still I, I treat them uh, the very similar way as treating the long haul patients and uh, they, they improve with the symptoms. Got it. And uh, Dr. Antonatos, folks are very curious about the states. So if you don't mind, I'm going to quickly show them the list of states that you have and how to reach you. So number one, uh, folks, here is the Dr. Antonatos website. Call or text. So here is the number to use. I do not have any financial or other interest in this. This is just a service for you. So you can contact him via these uh, mechanisms as well, and then he can go from there. This is his fee. He is also on Medici app. Somebody had asked that. And if I can very quickly go to FLCCC, where you can see which states. So if you go to FLCCC.net, as I'm doing right now, in here, if you go to Ivermectin and how to get Ivermectin, then within this, you would see a list of doctors, including Dr. Antonatos over here. So if I go down here, so just bear with me. I become blind when I am online as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think my focus just becomes very tunnel visioned. Um, I think um, I show in the, um, how to get Evermectin. Yeah, um, we found it. We found you. So here is Dr. Miguel Antonatos. And here is the phone number. Here's the site I showed you. And this is the list of uh, states. It may need to be updated. I think it is updated. But here are the states. Um, Dr. Antonatos, are the, is this a correct list? 
Yeah, I believe need to be up updated. I did not list the states that I use um, that are uh, under the COVID emergency uh, waiver. Um, there is uh, the website existence. Um, I updated as well uh, my information a few weeks ago and, uh, with all the states. Yeah, so there is one more website, which is this uh, existence.com. And in here, there is also a list of doctors. And I'm I believe Dr. Antonatos is here as well. Yeah, so this is a, a um, comprehensive list of uh, doctors prescribing uh, a, a COVID uh, a therapy and, uh, and for prevention. And it's actually an international list and have uh, many physicians as well in the, in the United States. And um, um, you will see a patient, a physician that are able to provide uh, telemedicine services. And um, I, I will be uh, in that list. And uh, I have my information updated as well in the website. Um, when you go to my website, you can uh, go to um, get started. There is a button in the menu, and uh, you will click, and uh, you will see a button in the bottom it, it probably many patients don't see it because sometimes it's a little tricky but if you scroll the way to the bottom you will see uh it say it gets started you click there and uh, it will show the list of uh and the states uh where i'm so uh, here. Uh, rendering services as well yes cool. so on dr antonato's site text to md.com if you go to the menu in the menu if you go to get started on that page get started you would see this list of the states as well. So I think this was an important question to um, bring that to everyone. So let's answer. I know that it is late on your side. You're on the East Coast. So let's answer a couple of more questions. So there is a question on Sumoko says, do I need a positive test for a long haul diagnosis? I think I had it 19 months ago. No, absolutely. No, no need to show me any positive tests. As uh, many of the patients that uh, uh, start treating with long haul symptoms, they did not even realize uh, they were COVID positive until they start uh, developing symptoms uh, weeks after uh, having a, a minor, uh, I would say, uh, cold uh, uh, symptoms. So those patients, uh, they come uh, with symptomatology very compatible with uh, long COVID, and uh, they never got tested. Uh, so it's not it's not a requirement uh, uh, to have a positive test as long as you have a, a, a symptoms compatible and you, you, you um, and you have a mild illness or some some patient actually they don't even feel that they have a mild illness they they just feel that they got exposed somehow a few months ago and uh, since then they start feeling. Uh, these uh, long haul symptoms. So, so those patients definitely, I, I don't think they will even look for getting tested as they were not feeling uh, bad at that time, but uh, the symptoms develop later, later in time. Got it. Thank you very much. And if you don't mind, I just want to make an announcement. Uh, team, please, yeah, uh, please remember tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., we will have Dr. Tariq Alim as well. Dr. Tariq Alim is the doctor from Bangladesh, who after the Kelly's study from Australia, he was the one who started using ivermectin and I believe azithromycin together or doxycycline. And that is what started the ball rolling for physicians to start using ivermectin. So he himself will be here tomorrow. And thanks to Dr. Samina Chaudhary, she is the one who connected me to him. So don't miss that. So back here, Denise has a question, uh, Dr. Antonatos. Have you ever seen side effects, uh, vision vision related side effects of ivermectin? Um, with ivermectin, with a standard dosage, the 0 0.2 milligrams kg, uh, very rarely I've seen any uh, uh, vision uh, uh, side effect. Uh, most of the time, I see this uh, side effect, uh, and actually, it's, it's, it's still rare to see them, but uh, most of the time, I see it in a 0 0.4 milligram dosage or higher, higher dosages. Um, I see patient, uh, it's very, very rare. I would probably say uh, patient uh, uh, have treated with uh, ivermectin, uh, very harmful patient uh, report uh, uh, vision side effects. Um, some patient actually uh, uh, that come uh, uh, want to be uh, prescribed ivermectin to have been used in the animal form. And uh, actually those patients def definitely develop uh, some uh, sort of uh, 
uh, vision or normality. At that time, I, I recommend patients to stop using the animal product, wait for a few days, and the symptoms get better. They can, they can definitely, we can try the uh, standard dose of ivermectin for prophylaxis. Uh, but I feel it's mostly due to the impurities and uh, it's not it's not regulated the animal form. And I'm not sure if, if, uh, if the dosage is, uh, I'm not sure how, how difficult is to get the, the proper dose with that, maybe may, may related to our dosages. Um, so that could be related to the, the, the visual normality, but uh, on a standard dose, they are making very, very rare. I've seen this. Got it. Thank you very much. Um, one or two more questions. Uh, one is M. Shorty says, is ivermectin safe for people with neurofibromatosis? Um, I haven't seen any data or any uh, uh, research uh, showing any uh, contraindication uh, to use ivermectin. Um, so I, I will probably, um, yeah, I would probably recommend. I don't see any contraindication with that. Got it. So um, one last question. What are the most common symptoms do you see in long haulers? So uh, most of the common symptoms is um, uh, patients are uh, extremely fatigued and they have a lack of energy. Um, most of those patients, uh, uh, they were very healthy uh, before uh, developing any symptoms. So actually, so those patients, uh, uh, most of these patients are long haul. Uh, I've seen uh, in a younger population, there are patients that are very active. They, they work out every day. Uh, they like to play sports. And uh, those patients develop the long haul symptoms and are uh, able to do uh, what they used to enjoy before, unfortunately, until they get treated. Um, I definitely recommend patients to uh, avoid any uh, uh, physical exertion as, uh, or strenuous exercise while they're being treated for long haul. As there is some research showing that uh, it could potentially increase a cytokine uh, um, doing a strenuous activity. Uh, for example, I have a patient, uh, he has been getting better uh, after taking the three course of ivermectin, and uh, he was feeling so good that he decided to play basketball, and uh, he developed symptoms next uh, the day after. So he had a relapse of the long haul, and uh, most, uh, most likely related to strenuous exercise. So I'm uh, going to um, treat it again with uh, uh, the regimen of ivermectin, and then um, hopefully symptoms start getting better very soon. Got it. Got it. Sorry, I said last question, but there is a couple of more questions that are important. Green Hulk says, Dr. Antonatos, where can I see you in person for medical advice? You are not practicing in Virginia. Um, so currently, I'm, I'm beard 12. Um, I used to work in the hospital, so that's uh, where patients were able to see me in person. But uh, right now, I'm, I'm virtual with telemedicine. I, I feel I'm helping way more patients uh, with COVID-19 being virtual than uh, just being in the hospital. When um, as uh, my last, uh, my first talk, I, I I relate my history why I decided to do virtual instead of uh, being in the hospital. Definitely, I feel like I got uh, more patients need to be. Uh, treated in the outpatient setting to avoid actually a hospitalization. So uh, right now I'm virtual uh, at this at this moment. I don't have an office. Um, I used to work at the hospital, but uh, I'm fully a uh, telemedicine uh, a practitioner at this time. Got it. Thank you very and much. About Virginia, I'm um, I'm in West Virginia. I'm working in Virginia, but I got West Virginia. I think it was a, a couple of months ago. But working in Virginia, um, definitely. Got it. Thank you very much. Just a quick question for me here. Nana is our expert says when you announce an upcoming live video, which time zone? So my time zones are always Pacific time zones. So tomorrow, 9 a.m. Pacific time and daily 6 p.m. Pacific time in the evening. Cool. So with this, um, Dr. Antonatos, thank you so much for your time and enlightenment. Uh, Tell me, generally, do you feel that the COVID is reducing, COVID is going away? What is your, so what are your parting message for us? Do we have hope that it is winding down or it is still raging? Oh, sorry, uh, Dr. Moya, I did not. I think uh, my headphones were a little disconnected, so I'm going to. Yes, I was going to, I was saying, number one, thank you very much for joining us. Number two, as your uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? So I cannot hear you back. 
your mic is not working actually your mic is muted can you hear me yes i can hear actually i can hear you much better this time um, so next interviews we'll we'll do them like this so number one i wanted to thank you yes, very yes, much I'll, for joining us today I'll, I'll the mic to help. <laughs> yes so thank you very much for joining me today one last comment for you and then we'll close and that is do you think that the the pandemic is now winding down do you see less patients of it or there still are a lot of patients um so i i think definitely the pandemic is still there i don't think it's over i think we need to be more cautious now uh even with the vaccinated people and uh, need to be more cautious now than before um i'm just looking at the data from the vaccines and uh, back in december when pfizer announced uh the vaccine was a 95 percent effective to prevent a uh, severe covid i i now see a few weeks ago uh I'm, i have been closely uh, following the data from israel and i see uh, a couple of weeks ago the pfizer vaccine was reported to be effective on 64 percent of uh, uh patients so i see now this trend keep going down with new variants um has been pretty much a kind of a 10 percent drop of effectivity uh effectiveness every month with the vaccine with the pfizer so uh, i feel uh, uh this is also gonna keep uh, uh dropping effectiveness with more variants emerging and uh now pfizer talking about uh, a third booster i'm not sure how many boosters they're gonna want to uh, uh create but uh my suspicion they definitely they wanna want to do more boosters um due to their um the interest uh in uh as a, a pharmaceutical company uh but uh definitely i i feel this pandemic is not over um i think it's something that uh, we need to be now more cautious with this delta variant uh we all need to be protected being vaccinated or not be more extra extra cautious uh definitely at this at this time got it so with this thank you very much for for your time today and thank you very much for sharing your the information for management cool beans thank you very much for being here and thank you very much for listening to this talk we will see each other tomorrow morning at 9 a.m pacific time we'll have dr thari kalam with us thank you and bye-bye for now thank you